Good morning, and thank you for joining us for Iowa, today's Iowa Creative Places Network webinar. My name is John Berg. I'm the Arts and Community Development Program Manager with the Iowa Arts Council. The Iowa Arts Council is your state arts agency, and we are pleased to present the Iowa Creative Places series, which are learning opportunities for communities across Iowa. Next slide. So the Iowa Arts Council supports creative placemaking and placekeeping efforts throughout uh, through grants, place-based designations, webinars, and events, technical assistance, and videos and storytelling. Next slide. Part of the support is offered to the Iowa Creative Places Network. To the Iowa Creative Places Network, we offer uh, we bring people together for workshops and events centered around arts, culture, heritage, and historic preservation, telling the story of the people, places, and points of pride that divide our state and provide tools and resources and connections to help communities create, preserve, and sustain their own authentic sense of place. Next slide. Today, we are uh, pleased to host several partners with Grinnell and U.S. Department of Agriculture for today's Creative Places Network webinar series, leveraging federal funding uh, for visioning and placemaking. And in this, for this particular project, build a better Grinnell 2030. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. All lines are currently muted and will be for the duration of the presentation to reduce background noise as this webinar is being recorded. Participants uh, will be emailed a link to the recording, and you're welcome to submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You may also use this feature if you are experiencing te technical difficulties, and you can send those messages to me directly, John Berg. Thanks again for joining us today. And now I will turn it over to Nicole burrow Barons from the Greater Powasheet Community Development Foundation, and we will introduce, uh, and, and the various presenters will introduce themselves throughout the presentation. Nicole, I'll send it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to hear about our project in Grinnell called Build a Better Grinnell. Um, I just wanted to point out the website. If you're interested, you can go to the website on the slide and um, see more information about our project. Um, as John said, and I'm also advancing slides, so if, there we go. Um, as John said, we have very um, various partners that were um, involved in, in the initiation of, of the Build a Better Grinnell project. And you'll hear, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> from a few of us in the next few slides, um, giving some information about our organizations. You can see Grinnell College, the Claude W. and Dolly Arns Foundation, the City of Grinnell, Grinnell Mutual Reinsurance, Greater Powasheet Community Foundation, and the Grinnell Chamber. But there are just a few of us here um, providing more information about our organizations. And I will start by telling you a bit about Greater Powasheet Community Foundation and how we have been involved in the project. We've acted as a convener. Um, we have um, been a subrecipient of the, the USDA grant, and we used um, our sub in our subrecipient role. We've hired some support research staff, and then we've also helped um, pay community researchers through the grant too. And another role that we've played is as a fundraiser for the project. We, we have a Build a Better Grinnell fund here at the foundation that we're using to pay um, various um, expenses that aren't covered under the USDA Rural Development Grant. And now I will turn it over to Julie Gosling to talk a bit about the Arns Foundation. Hi everyone, my name is Julie Goslink and um, I uh, am representing the Claude and Dolly Arns Foundation today. We are a private family foundation that was created in 1993. So we are celebrating our 30th year this year. And the Arns Foundation has been supporting various programs and different community initiatives in Grinnell. And we have, um, a sample here of our partner program showing 10 different um, partner programs that work very closely with our foundation um, and in the community to help support various needs, whether it's uh, addressing um, housing insecurity, food insecurity, mental health, parks and recreation, education, um, various um, programs that involve kids and, and the school district in our community. And so our, our 
interest in parks and recreation, education, health and wellness are really at the top of our list. And uh, we do take a very uh, collaborative approach with various community partners like the Greater Powashi Community Foundation, Grinnell College, and Grinnell Mutual, who um, are our community partners on the webinar today in tackling various community um, projects and the Build a Better Grinnell is just one great example of, of a collaborative uh, approach. Okay, next slide. And um, I would like to introduce to you now, Melissa Strovers, who will be speaking on behalf of Grinnell College. Melissa is the Director of Collective Impact in the Office of Community Partnerships, Planning and Research. Thank you, Julie. I am pleased to be here to present with this group of amazing colleagues and partners. Grinnell College is located in Grinnell, Iowa. It's a private co-ed liberal arts and sciences colleges that spans across 120 acres. Grinnell is consistently ranked among the top liberal arts colleges in the nation. The campus is home to approximately 1,700 students representing all 50 states and 40 plus countries. Grinnell College has been a partner in community-based projects for more than 20 years. Because of the college's commitment to our place, Grinnell College plays an active role in community development. We consider ourselves an anchor institution because we are rooted in place and serve as an economic engine in our community. Grinnell College has access to resources, human capital, people power, as we like to call it, and technical expertise, among other things, to provide the backbone or collaborative infrastructure for many campus and community initiatives. On this project, Grinnell College serves as the co-backbone -back with the Greater Powashi Community Foundation. In this role, the college shares the responsibility of facilitating, coordinating, and supporting partners to implement work that moves the common agenda forward. We'll talk more about the backbone role and introduce collective impact later in the slides. Now I'm pleased to turn it over to Barb Baker. Thank you, Melissa. Hello, everyone. I'm Barb Baker. I'm the Advertising and Community Relations Director here at Grinnell Mutual. I'm happy to be here to speak about my company and our involvement in this Build a Better Grinnell project. Grinnell Mutual is a 115 year old property casualty insurance and reinsurance company. We were founded in the Midwest and we've been at home in Grinnell since the 1930s. Grinnell Mutual ranks first in North America in the farm mutual reinsurance business, so we're very proud of that, and we rank in the top 5% out of 200, excuse me, 2,500 property casualty companies in the United States. So we're proud to say we have 825 employees, and we consider more than 600 of those employees local or within 75 miles of Grinnell. Our corporate and community foundation goals include supporting our employees in the communities that they call home. It's easy to see that our company's success is in part determined by the community that surrounds us. So we feel we need a vibrant community with strong medical care and good public education. We need successful community businesses and industries to be able to maintain our own vitality and workforce. And if our community isn't growing in a number of ways, neither will our company. Now more than ever, our company, Grinnell Mutual, recognizes the need to support the vitality of both Grinnell and our surrounding communities. If we have the resources to help with projects like this one, it is beneficial to all of us. Now I'd like to turn it back to Nicole. Sorry, having a little technical difficulty there. So um, the Build a Better Grinnell project goals include um, looking at um, branding and I'd, using the, the process to brand um, the, our project and then identify community strengths. We also um, wanted to gather feedback so that we could set priorities through a very broadly participatory process, which we'll go into in greater detail um, a little later in the presentation. And then we, we also wanted to prioritize needs 
and that are actionable and impactful. And then kind of the next step is to um, work with community organizations to, you know, create programming related to those needs and, um, and then implement anything that needs to happen in order to reverse things that we're seeing happening in the community that we want to change. So um, what is this visioning project? It includes a needs assessment that identifies gaps in needs, strengths, resources, values, and attitudes, priorities, and, and um, looking at it, looking at the whole community, trying to gather input from all people, including people who aren't always at the table. And, um, and the process probably will take about 18 months, at least for the data gathering. And um, we hope that through this process, we'll build commitment to action. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Strovers to talk about collective impact. Thanks, Nicole. Let's advance the slide, please. As I mentioned in my introductory slide, the college's role in the Build a Better Grinnell Vision Project is serving as a backbone. In this role is a function really of, collective, of the collective impact framework. The collective impact framework was first published in 2011, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review. Essentially, collective impact brings organizations together in a structured way to achieve population level and systems change. It focuses on alignments and results. It is a framework and guide rather than a checklist or formula and, because, and can be customized for the local context. The community has experience with the collective impact framework. For the past eight years, we've used collective impact on a highly impactful community project that brings together community partners to support kids and families in Grinnell. That project has received local, state, and national accolades. Because we were familiar with this framework, Grinnell College and the Greater Community Foundation were prepared to serve in the same role for Build a Better Grinnell. Next slide, please. So what is a backbone? The backbone provides a mix of strategic and logistical functions that help to support the network of organizations who are the content experts. Some specific examples of the backbone function uh, may include grant writing, fundraising, convening, organizing, among other activities. Next slide, please. So when we say network, what do we mean? We mean the community partners who are involved in the project. The collective impact framework is based on a network-based approach that focuses more on the effective function of the group versus the individual organization. It allows us to tap into the exponential power of multiple organizations, not just one. Together, we are able to provide greater resources across the network. This results in more focused energy behind co-created solutions. As you'll see in our presentation, the network is essential to the success of the project, which is where our story begins. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Julie. Thanks, Melissa. And go on to the next slide here. And we'll talk a little bit on some background of the community of Grinnell. Grinnell is located near central Iowa or centrally located, uh, as you can see on the map in Powasheet County, and it is coined the Jewel of the Prairie. A few years ago, we received the Great Places designation, and with a population of just under 10,000, as uh, you've heard from, Grinnell, uh, from Melissa, Grinnell is the home of Grinnell College, of course, and has a strong history of social justice diversity of students and diversity in our in our community. We also um, highlight some areas of architecture and and rich in arts and culture, health and wellness and parks and recreation. You could see some of the photos here of the Grinnell area. And next slide, please. And so I wanted to just give a, a quick background of a similar project that our, um, our group had um, entailed about 10 years ago. And Grinnell actually went through a similar study with a community assessment in um, 2010 through 2012 with survey results in 2012 that we shared community-wide. And at this time, um, when we 
first did our community assessment with multiple partners. We had a similar mission statement and really had never been through this process together. And so we um, wanted to make informed decisions at the time about our community, the economic, uh, social service, educational, philanthropic development areas that will um, you know, hopefully shape Grinnell for the better. And here we are 10 years later, um, when we first started talking about revisiting another community assessment, um, we came together last year and started to think, okay, so what should we do now? What things worked well um, and what projects succeeded? What didn't? What are the changes in our economy today and our, our um, social landscape? How are they different? And so when we first took a look at forming this group again and revisiting another assessment, what what were the major changes? And what we came up with is that about 10 years ago, when we um, completed the first study, we really found um, a lot of people were interested in physical changes, physical assets, the more tangible things in the community, such as our community facilities, library, um, school district, facilities, um, you know, our park facilities and what things really needed upgraded, what what were things that we didn't have in the community. But this time around, you know, post pandemic and with the state of the economy, we're now looking at um, inflation and people are, you know, struggling a little more with with the uh, economic landscape. And so we're focused this time more on the social services and the needs of um, basic needs really of, of the community and families and individuals. And so that's really been the focus of this study and we've seen that in our results so far. Now, um, next is, gosh. Barb. Barb, yes, thank you, Barb, <laughs> sorry. No problem. So thank you, Julie. As this process began, our um, lead team, the group that's been identified here came together with the researcher whom you will meet in just a little bit. And we began to strategize and identify the key supporters to this whole project. The team felt extremely confident based on the strong relationships that we have built across the community that the groups or entities um, who were the key supporters would help fund the project. So we started out really kind of thinking we would need to privately uh, fund this project and the things that we needed within the community. And we'll talk more about this list and the relationships in just a little bit. But additionally, the team quickly identified outlying supporters, those individuals and entities that could be stakeholders in the process and or the outcomes. So these supporters could possibly offer financial or informational resources um, and as Julie mentioned, the scope of the project really quickly grew and the team realized it needed to look for additional resources to affect the outcome that we were looking for. So many of us have worked together on a variety of community projects. And as Julie mentioned with the pandemic, I think um, we really kind of cemented our relationships. And I've called this our spider web in the past because we have such a strong trust between those of us who are here today with you and some other community members and we're basically a core team that um, can take an idea and continue to reach out through our relationship networks to weave people together for a common cause. So that was my spider web um, analogy one day. And this is where we spent time looking deep into the community at who might have an interest in building Grinnell into a better community, who might be a target demographic that isn't currently represented um, especially the underserved, the underrepresented we talk about, and the under the radar populations, and who might be a user of city resources, but not necessarily a city resident. We have rural residents that consider Grinnell home. We have in commuters. I mentioned that we have um, several employees who commute into Grinnell Mutual every day. Um, we have shoppers who come here. We have a lot of frequent visitors, whether they be family members or have relationships with people in the community. So we needed to look at a bunch of different groups really um, in considering the audience that we wanted to serve. 
And while we gained some initial funding through the groups mentioned and gathered interested parties to provide this guidance and input, we realized the project would likely exceed our local seed funding and its success was very dependent on secured, securing these additional funds. So I'm gonna pass the floor to Melissa who will tell you all about what happened next. Thanks, Barb. And you know, Barb's uh, uh, analysis of the spider web is, I just so much uh, appreciate that analysis because it really does describe um, our working relationships with our community partners over the years. And I think this is um, a, a wonderful example of how we've really leveraged those relationships uh, of trust that have been developed over time with so many community projects. And on this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the federal funding, share with you the timing, um, how it, uh, it, it all came together, and um, give you some background. Um, so let's start out with July 7th. It, it all really started then. Uh, July 7th, uh, 2022, when President Ann Harris, the president of Grinnell College, became aware of the USDA Rural Placemaking Innovation Challenge Funding Opportunity. A little more than five months later, Grinnell College, on behalf of the Grinnell community, was the recipient of more than $197,000 in funding to support the Build a Better Grinnell Vision Project, the first USDA uh, RPIC award ever received in Iowa. Now I'd like for you to pay particular attention to the red circle as I share the behind the scenes story of how the application submission process unfolded. Notice the timing. From the time that we were alerted about the funding on July 7th, we had about six weeks to create a federal proposal, which is no easy task. Uh, the six weeks were pivotal. It was a process where relationships and trust were essential. We had to work across multiple organizations, multiple states, as many of us were traveling on vacation and in trainings, as you can see, it was in the middle of summer, decide on a document sharing platform and navigate the federal systems, uh, which were a challenge. Thankfully, as Barb mentioned, a small group of partners had already started working together on the project planning when we learned about the grant. The federal funding presented an opportunity to focus and advance our project plan and budget and really get the project started in a very big way with access to the majority of the funding needed provided through this funding opportunity. For the USDA proposal, we quickly brought in new partners who were critical to the success of the project. For example, we had uh, the opportunity to work with uh, the research director from Grinnell College and the Grinnell College grants and accounting team who successfully led us through the submission process. The application required a significant amount of time, relationship building, as I mentioned, trust, and lots of energy to get the application across the finish line. But collectively, we worked together to define the project, develop the timeline, develop the budget, create performance measures, and tell our story. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to share more specifics about the funding. Thank you, Melissa. So um, the USDA Rural Development Grant um, that we received really changed the scope of the project. It allowed us to do so much more than we were hoping. Um, we had, at, before we'd received funding, we had leveraged local financial support of $40,000 from four community partners. So that, you know, plus the 197,000 that we received from, for the RPIC grant really, like I said, um, allowed us to, to expand the, the timing of the project, but also do more in terms of the research and it increased the rigor of our research. We hired researchers and a coordinator. We um, increased the timeline, as I had mentioned, and then we, we, we really have made an effort to reach marginalized groups and professionalize our process. Let's see, I'm going to turn it over now to, I believe, back to Melissa. Actually, it's me, Nicole. Oh, Julie. sorry, Julie. No <laughs> problem. No problem. So um, Grinnell College is serving as the anchor institution or backbone to the pro project, like Melissa had said, to provide the power of human capital and also the technical capacity, especially in the areas of grant writing and research. 
So why else would the community want to partner with a college on this type of initiative? Well, many reasons. Uh, the college is a very important segment of the community. Grinnell College happens to be the largest employer in Grinnell. And there is a vast diversity of workforce and student population with many from um, countries from all over the world. And college students were hired as research assistants. And they also, the students provide a unique perspective as respondents from the outside because they're coming from all over the world, all over the United States, and they're living here for four years. And so they have a really unique perspective with unique needs also culturally, socially, and economically. And so now back to Barb, who's going to tell you more about our community collaborations. Yes, I am. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Uh, so if you're listening to this, you may be wondering how a community without an established anchor institution could pursue this sort of opportunity. And we understand um, your concern. I won't say that we have all of the answers, but we're going to try and give you some ideas of how this might work for you. We're extremely fortunate to have Grinnell College and the Arns Foundation and Greater Powasheet Community Foundation helping lead this effort in Grinnell for the second time in 10 years. It's just as a community member myself, it's, it's just a great opportunity to see these groups come together and have not only the capacity, but the desire to um, lead this initiative. But we feel that any community can initiate a similar project. Knowing it's been done in other places, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So who are your key stakeholders in your community? Think of who those people happen to be that are responsive, that provide positive reinforcement or guidance or resources and will support your plan. That's probably the first place that you start. And then who are your community collaborators? Those who are willing to go out and able to be involved in the nitty gritty work. Who are your go-getters? Um, who are the those with a talent or a resource that adds to the project? Again, it's not all financial. It's a lot of um, hard work, as Melissa stated, even uh, looking for grants or applying for grants. Um, look for your other stakeholders, the end users, the benefactors, especially as it relates these days to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in your community. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about those who maybe are underserved or not currently served. And so consider anyone and everyone from your youth to your senior citizen populations, to your minorities, to your unserved and underserved, um, religious and service organizations, all of those groups have a stake in what you do in a community project like this. Um, look hard into the people and organizations that are not often invited to the table. Sometimes we put out that blanket, hey, if you want to come to this meeting or you want to be involved, get hold of us. Some people need a personal invitation, and that's when you look a little bit harder at who has the capacity to lend some important information to your project. And who's providing services to your community? Don't forget about your health care providers and your social workers and your law enforcement and your clergy and your child care providers. All of those people end up being stakeholders and very important collaborators in a project. So ensure they have a strong voice in the discussion and planning stages to help you along. Another thing I would say we would recommend is um, consider your community colleges. They might not be in your town, but they're in your neighborhood and they have students and instructors and programs that can help you. Private and public colleges, again, we're very, very fortunate to have Grinnell College whose mission is to support our community in so many ways, but there are other private colleges not very far from you most likely and the public universities have all kinds of classes and um, opportunities and departments that are oftentimes looking to help with projects in communities. And think of the services that they may have to offer. You might not know them, but you know somebody who knows somebody who can help you along. And just some of the, the other places that we've had assistance with 
with some of our projects, the USDA Rural Development certainly is an opportunity. The Iowa Economic Development Authority certainly can provide opportunities and a lot of expertise. And the Iowa Rural Development Council is one that I would also plug because Rural Development Council is really established in working to help communities, whether it's um, broadband, whether it's leadership, whether it's projects in your community, your local extension office. And those are just to name a few. So those are resources that you can turn to. Next, you'll hear from Monty Roper, who will tell you where our project is now. Thanks, Barb. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Monty Roper. I am associate professor and chair of the Department of Anthropology at Grinnell College, and I am the research director for the project. I'm going to give an overview of the research process and where we are now. There are basically three primary phases within the research process itself. We started out with a very broad phase where using a visioning survey in the community where we were just asking people generally to talk about their frustrations, their needs, uh, what they viewed as strengths in the communities, things that they particularly appreciated about the community. And this is really just casting a, a very broad net uh, to understand both the strengths, but also to, to begin looking at the issues that people might want to address. And that ran from December through April of 23. We are currently in phase two, which is the prioritization process. And what we did is we took all of those needs that were defined in phase one, and we organized them and we categorized and we limited it down to a set of 46 broad-based needs that we found covered most of what had been identified in that first survey. Now we've created a second survey and we put that back into the community and we're asking people now to, to rank their top seven issues, to, to pick the top seven out of the 46 or so that we identified in round one and to decide what their order was one through seven. Uh, at the same time as part of this prioritization process, we're collecting a lot of information on three other, sorry, four other peer communities that we identified as a steering committee. We're also collecting and processing a lot of information from lots of organizations in the community that have a sense of what the needs are because members of the community have gone to those organizations and expressed their needs by asking for resources or looking for places where they can get the resources. And so at the end of this phase, we'll have the, the prioritization information from the community, we'll have the peer community comparisons, and we will have the express needs. And then we will pick five to seven of those needs to move forward into a deeper dive based on those, those priorities. Uh, and then a couple of those issues will be identified by the steering committee itself based on the additional information. The phase three is a deeper dive and that's where we will look at those top five to seven issues that we've identified. You know, the, the research started out not as a needs assessment for health or a needs assessment for the elderly, but really totally open to a needs assessment for anything and everything that anyone identified. And so it's been necessarily broad. This phase three is a chance to really look much deeper into the issues that get prioritized by the community. And what that will mean is going out and doing focus groups and having listening sessions around each of those key issues that gets identified. Um, as well as looking at how other communities have addressed those problems and, and whether or not the solutions that they came up with might work here. Um, and in addition, while we're doing this, we've got these three phases of research throughout this research phase. So running all the way from December through January of 24, we are doing an ongoing community mapping, uh, asset mapping. Uh, and so that's basically looking at what strengths and assets exist in the community, what resources we have, um, how, what organizations interact with, with what other organizations. Uh, so all of that can then be brought to bear and thinking about how to address the issues that are identified in the prioritization process. Uh, next slide, please. So at the end of that research phase, at the end of that deep dive, we're gonna end up with a set of final 
products. We're going to have the assessment of the strengths and assets in the community, right? Our asset mapping or our strengths-based assessment. We are going to have an identification and prioritization of needs based on the community's ranking. We are going to have an assessment of those prioritized needs. In other words, we're going to have a, a bunch of information much deeper into understanding the local context of those needs, as well as a lot more information on the assets that exist that or that could exist uh, around those needs. We will also have a review of local ideas for addressing those needs. So part of the deep dive, we'll be talking to people about how they would like to see these, these issues addressed or what ideas they might have. And then we will have a review of broader policy alternatives. Again, ways that things that have been identified in other communities as ways to potentially solve these. Next slide, please. Then we move into phase four. So that'll be the end of the phase three finishes up the research phase. Then we move to a, an action phase. All that information, the, that previous slide, uh, then gets handed over to a set of working groups that we create around each of the prioritized needs. So say we have seven prioritized needs, we will create seven working groups and their goal will be to develop action plans to, to re review the information that we provide. We're not gonna provide just one solution and say, well, here's what you do. We're gonna provide all of that data that we talked about and a set of solutions that might potentially work and kind of the pros and cons of each one. And then it's up to the action, uh, excuse me, the working groups to come up with which of those uh, possibilities or potentially another possibility they would like to follow through on to develop action plans and begin initiating change. And one of the questions that when I've presented this to the community recently is, okay, well, where's that funding gonna come from then? You're gonna have all of these projects that you're trying to come up with. Well, part of the way that we would address this is by through that asset mapping. So what organizations do we currently have? What funds do we currently have in the community? Um, but we also might have to look to the outside for funding and we've built very strong relationships and we're building strong relationships with the USDA through this project. And USDA has a number of resources available for follow-up projects. And I'm gonna pass it now to Brett, who is a community program specialist with the USDA to talk more about what some of those opportunities might be. Thank you, good morning. I was just, I'm, with, I'm Brett Livingood. I'm with the USDA Rural Development. I just want to take a few minutes and talk about some of the programs that are available to fund projects in our rural areas. There is, uh, so we'll start off with uh, water and environmental programs. Those are programs that would include water systems and sewer systems for cities and municipalities. Generally for cities and municipalities with a population of 10,000 or less and they offer loan and grant programs for those. Um, there is some upfront, usually some engineering costs with water projects and sewer projects. So for the smaller communities in particular, with the population of less than 2,500, they do offer what they call a search grant. And it can be up to $30,000 for engineering costs to developing EERs for their system and, and identifying the needs. Now, the programs I'm discussing today are on the USDA Rural Development Iowa website. And the ones I'm speaking of are currently open and um, communities can, can apply for them. Now, community facilities is the other side um, that is available. With that one, the applicant can be like a public body, nonprofit, or a federally recognized Indian tribe. So all our projects do have to have broad-based community support. So we generally we speak with local leaders, including you know, letters of recommendations from leaders in the community. We focus, like I said, on the rural areas. And all the facilities have to be for public use, and we do use the median household income in determining eligibility and grant eligibility. 
we do offer loans for the water side, water and sewer side, as well as the community program side here. For the community facilities, loans can last up to 40 years, and the current interest rate is 3.75%. That does adjust quarterly. However, once the funds are obligated, the rate is fixed for the life of the loan. Many times, our applicants will have lenders that they prefer to work with or have a past relationship with. They are able to work with, with the lender of their choice and they meet the qualifications. Sometimes we can provide a guarantee to make that lender more comfortable in extending the credit to them. For grant opportunities, grant dollars are limited. One of the annual grants that we've had in the past years is each, there's 10 area offices in the state of Iowa. So it covers about 10 counties. And this year, there's $28,900 that was available in each area office. And some of the things that communities have applied for and has been successful in getting those grant dollars for would be public safety, so fire equipment, police equipment. Those are some of the common things that that would be used for. And then we do have a slide with the different project types of projects that we do fund at USDA Rural Development. So medical and healthcare, certainly hospitals and clinics, We've done several projects. We've provided financing for them. Public safety, there's been grant opportunities and loan opportunities for police and fire equipment, fire stations, police stations. And then for the educational side, certainly there's a big focus on providing facilities for childcare libraries, and then also colleges, private colleges as well. And then for public facilities, city halls, um, community centers, airports, those roads and bridges, also on the business program side, there is funding for those programs. And then we do have a map of the state of Iowa here that shows the 10 areas. And each of the offices do have a local contact, a community program specialist, and also an assistant community program specialist. Certainly, if you go on the USDA Rural Development Iowa website, we do have the phone numbers listed. Definitely reach out to your local office if you think that you might have a project that would possibly qualify, or if you want to speak more about some of the opportunities that's available. Thank you for your time. And I can jump in here. Uh, just wanted to open it up now for uh, questions. And we are actually going to uh, round out the presentation today. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, would you just like to thank uh, all of the panelists and the community for uh, talking about this this project, really just kind of showing how um, how different uh, partners can come together to look at and vision about um, uh, what the next steps in the next ten years of the community looks like. Um, so what I'm going to do now is end the recording.